Story 91 of Household Tales, The Gnome. There was once upon a time a rich king who had three daughters, who daily went to walk in the palace garden, and the king was a great lover of all kinds of fine trees. But there was one for which he had such an affection, that if anyone gathered an apple from it, he wished him a hundred fathoms underground. And when harvest time came, the apples on this tree were all as red as blood. The three daughters went every day beneath the tree and looked to see if the wind had not blown down an apple, but they never by any chance found one, and the tree was so loaded with them that it was almost breaking, and the branches hung down to the ground. Then the king's youngest child had a great desire for an apple, and said to her sisters, Our father loves us far too much to wish us underground. It is my belief that he would only do that to people who are strangers. And while she was speaking, the child plucked off quite a large apple and ran to her sisters, saying, Just a taste, my dear little sisters, for never in my life have I tasted anything so delightful. Then the two sisters also ate some of the apple, whereupon all three sank deep down into the earth, where they could hear no cock crow. When midday came, the king wished to call them to come to dinner, but they were nowhere to be found, and he sought them everywhere in the palace and garden, but could not find them. Then he was much troubled, and made known to the whole land that whosoever brought his daughters back again should have one of them to wife. Hereupon so many young men went about the country in search that there was no counting them, for everyone loved the three children because they were so kind to all, and so fair of face. Three young huntsmen also went out, and when they had traveled about for eight days, they arrived at a great castle, in which were beautiful apartments, and in one room a table was laid on which were delicate dishes, which were so warm that they were smoking. But in the whole of the castle, no human being was either to be seen or heard. They waited there for half a day, and the food still remained warm and smoking. And at length, they were so hungry that they sat down and ate, and agreed with each other that they would stay and live in that castle, and that one of them, who should be chosen by casting lots, should remain in the house and the two others seek the king's daughters. They cast lots, and the lot fell to the eldest. So next day, the two younger went out to seek, and the eldest had to stay at home. At midday came a small, small mannequin, and begged for a piece of bread. Then the huntsman took the bread, which he had found there, and cut around off the loaf, was about to give it to him, but whilst he was giving it to the mannequin, the latter let it fall, and asked the huntsman to be so good as to give him that piece again. The huntsman was about to do so, and stooped, on which the mannequin took a stick, seized him by the hair, and gave him a good beating. Next day, the second stayed at home, and he fared no better. When the two others returned in the evening, the eldest said, Well, how have we got on? Oh, very badly, said he, and then they lamented their misfortune together. But they said nothing about it to the youngest, for they did not like him at all and always called him Stupid Hans, because he did not exactly belong to the forest. On the third day, the youngest stayed at home, and again the little mannequin came and begged for a piece of bread. When the youth gave it to him, the elf let it fall as before, and asked him to be so good as to give him that piece again. Then said Hans to the little mannequin, What, canst thou not pick up that piece thyself? And if thou wilt not take as much trouble as that, for thy daily bread, thou dost not deserve to have it. Then the mannequin grew very angry and said, He was to do it, but the huntsman would not, and took my dear mannequin and gave him a thorough beating. Then the mannequin screamed terribly and cried, Stop, stop, and let me go, and I will tell thee where the king's daughters are. When Hans heard that, he left off beating him, and the mannequin told him that he was an earth mannequin, and that there were more than a thousand like him, 
and that if he would go with him, he would show him where the king's daughters were. Then he showed him a deep well, and there was no water in it, and the elf said that he knew well that the companions Hans had with him did not intend to deal honorably with him. Therefore, if he wished to deliver the king's children, he must do it alone. The other two brothers would also be very glad to recover the king's daughters, but they did not want to have any trouble or danger. Hans was therefore to take a large basket, and he must seat himself in it and his hanger and a bell, and let down. Below were three rooms, and in each of them was a princess with a many-headed dragon, whose head she was to comb and trim, but he must cut them off, and having said all this, the elf vanished. When it was evening, the two brothers came and asked how he had got on, and he said, pretty well so far, and that he had seen no one except at midday when a little mannequin had come and begged for a piece of bread, that he had given some to him, but that the mannequin had let it fall and had asked him to pick it up again. But as he did not choose to do that, the elf had begun to lose his temper, and that he had done what he ought not, and had given the elf a beating, on which he had told him where the king's daughters were. Then the two were so angry at this that they grew green and yellow. Next morning, they went to the well together and drew lots, who should first seat himself in the basket. And again, the lot fell on the eldest, and he was to seat himself in it and take the bell with him. Then he said, If I ring, you must draw me up again immediately. When he had gone down for a short distance, he rang, and they at once drew him up again. Then the second seated himself in the basket and did just the same as the first. And then it was the turn of the youngest, but he let himself be lowered quite to the bottom. When he had got out of the basket, he took his hanger and went and stood outside the first door and listened, and heard the dragon snoring quite loudly. He opened the door slowly, and one of the princesses was sitting there and had nine dragons' heads lying upon her lap and was combing them. Then he took his hanger and hewed at them, and the nine fell off. The princess sprang up, threw her arms round his neck, embraced and kissed him repeatedly, and took her stomacher, which was made of pure gold, and hung it around his neck. Then he went to the second princess, who had a dragon with five heads to comb, and delivered her also, and the youngest, who had a dragon with four heads, and he went likewise. And they all rejoiced and embraced him and kissed him without stopping. Then he rang very loud so that those above heard him, and he placed the princesses one after the other in the basket and had them all drawn up. But when it came to his own turn, he remembered the words of the elf who had told him that his comrades did not mean well by him. So he took a great stone which was lying there and placed it in the basket. And when it was about halfway up, his false brothers above cut the rope so that the basket with the stone fell to the ground. And they thought that he was dead and ran away with the three princesses, making them promise to tell their father that it was they who had delivered them. And then they went to the king and each demanded a princess in marriage. In the meantime, the youngest huntsman was wandering about the three chambers in great trouble, fully expecting to have to end his days there, when he saw, hanging on the wall, a flute. Then he said, Why dost thou hang there? No one can be merry here. He looked at the dragon's heads likewise and said, You too cannot help me now. He walked backwards and forwards for such a long time that he made the surface of the ground quite smooth, and at last other thoughts came to his mind, and he took the flute from the wall and played a few notes on it, and suddenly a number of elves appeared, and with every note that he sounded, one more came. Then he played until the room was entirely filled, and they all asked what he desired. So he said he wished to get above ground back to the daylight. 
on which they seized him by every hair that grew on his head, and thus they flew with him onto the earth again. When he was above ground, he at once went to the king's palace, just as the wedding of one princess was about to be celebrated, and he went to the room where the king and his three daughters were. When the princesses saw him, they fainted. Hereupon the king was angry, and ordered him to be put to prison at once, because he thought he must have done some injury to the children. When the princesses came to themselves, however, they entreated the king to set him free again. The king asked why, and they said that they were not allowed to tell that, but their father said that they were to tell it to the stove. And he went out, listened at the door, and heard everything. Then he caused the two brothers to be hanged on the gallows, and the third he gave his youngest daughter. And on that occasion, I wore a pair of glass shoes, and I struck them against a stone, and they said, Clink, and were broken. End of Story 91 Story 92 of Household Tales Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Translated by Margaret Hunt The King of the Golden Mountain There was a certain merchant who had two children, a boy and a girl. They were both young and could not walk. And two richly laden ships of his sailed forth to sea with all his property on board. And just as he was expecting to win much money by them, news came that they had gone to the bottom and now instead of being a rich man, he was a poor one and had nothing left but one field outside the town. In order to drive his misfortune a little out of his thoughts, he went out to this field and as he was walking forwards and backwards in it, a little black mannequin stood suddenly by his side and asked why he was so sad and what he was taking so much to heart. Then said the merchant, If thou couldst help me, I would willingly tell thee. Who knows? replied the black dwarf. Perhaps I can help thee. Then the merchant told him that all he possessed had gone to the bottom of the sea and that he had nothing left but this field. Do not trouble thyself, said the dwarf. If thou wilt promise to give me the first thing that rubs itself against thy leg when thou art at home again and to bring it here to this place in twelve years time, thou shalt have as much money as thou wilt. The merchant thought, What can that be but my dog? And did not remember his little boy, so he said yes, gave the black man a written and sealed promise and went home. When he reached home, his little boy was so delighted that he held by a bench, tottered up to him and seized him fast by the legs. The father was shocked, for he remembered his promise and now knew what he had pledged himself to do. As, however, he still found no money in his chest, he thought that the dwarf had only been jesting. A month afterwards, he went up to the garret, intending to gather together some old tin and to sell it, and saw a great heap of money lying. Then he was happy again, made purchases, became a greater merchant than before and felt that this world was well governed. In the meantime, the boy grew tall and at the same time sharp and clever. But the nearer the twelfth year approached, the more anxious grew the merchant, so that his distress might be seen in his face. One day his son asked what ailed him, but the father would not say. The boy, however, persisted so long that at last he told him that, without being aware of what he was doing, he had promised him to a black dwarf and had received much money for doing so. He said likewise that he had set his hand and seal to this, and that now, when twelve years had gone by, he would have to give him up. 
Then said the son, O oh, father, do not be uneasy, all will go well. The black man has no power over me. The son had himself blessed by the priest, and when the time came, father and son went together to the field, and the son made a circle and placed himself inside it with his father. Then came the black dwarf and said to the old man, Hast thou brought with thee that which thou hast promised me? He was silent, but the son asked, What dost thou want here? Then said the black dwarf, I have to speak with thy father and not with thee. The son replied, Thou hast betrayed and misled my father. Give back the writing. No, said the black dwarf. I will not give up my rights. They spoke together for a long time after this, but at last they agreed that the son, as he did not belong to the enemy of mankind, nor yet to his father, should seat himself in a small boat which should lie on water, which was flowing away from them, and that the father should push it off with his own foot, and then the son should remain given up to the water. So he took leave of his father, placed himself in a little boat, and the father had to push it off with his own foot. The boat capsized so that the keel was uppermost, and the father believed his son was lost, and went home and mourned for him. The boat, however, did not sink, but floated quietly away, and the boy sat safely inside it, and it floated thus for a long time until at last it stopped by an unknown shore. Then he landed and saw a beautiful castle before him and set out to go to it. But when he entered it, he found that it was bewitched. He went through every room, but all were empty until he reached the last, where a snake lay coiled in a ring. The snake, however, was an enchanted maiden who rejoiced to see him and said, Hast thou come, O oh my deliverer? I have already waited twelve years for thee. This kingdom is bewitched, and thou must set it free. How can I do that? he inquired. Tonight come twelve black men covered with chains, who will ask what thou art doing here. Keep silent, give them no answer, and let them do what they will with thee. They will torment thee, beat thee, stab thee, let everything pass. Only do not speak, at twelve o'clock they must go away again. On the second night, twelve others will come. On the third, four and twenty, who will cut off thy head. But at twelve o'clock, their power will be over. And then, if thou hast endured all, and hast not spoken the slightest word, I shall be released. I will come to thee, and will have in a bottle some of the water of life. I will rub thee with that, and then thou wilt come to life again, and be as healthy as before. Then said he, I will gladly set thee free. And everything happened just as she had said. The black man could not force a single word from him, and on the third night the snake became a beautiful princess who came with the water of life and brought him back to life again. So she threw herself into his arms and kissed him, and there was joy and gladness in the whole castle. After this their marriage was celebrated and he was king of the Golden Mountain. They lived very happily together, and the queen bore a fine boy. Eight years had already gone by when the king bethought of his father. His heart was moved, and he wished to visit him. The queen, however, would not let him go away and said, 
I know beforehand that it will cause my unhappiness. But he suffered her to have no rest until she consented. At their parting she gave him a wishing ring and said, Take this ring and put it on thy finger, and then thou wilt immediately be transported whithersoever thou wouldst be. Only thou must promise me not to use it in wishing me away from this place and with thy father. That he promised her, put the ring on his finger and wished himself at home just outside the town where his father lived. Instantly he found himself there and made for the town. But when he came to the gate, the sentries would not let him in, because he wore such strange and yet such rich and magnificent clothing. Then he went to a hill where a shepherd was watching his sheep, changed clothes with him, put on his old shepherd's coat and then entered the town without hindrance. When he came to his father, he made himself known to him. But he did not at all believe that the shepherd was his son and said, he certainly had had a son, but that he was dead long ago. However, as he saw he was a poor, needy shepherd, he would give him something to eat. Then the shepherd said to his parents, I am verily your son. Do you know of no mark on my body by which you could recognize me? Yes, said his mother. Our son had a raspberry mark under his right arm. He slipped back his shirt and they saw the raspberry under his right arm and no longer doubted that he was their son. Then he told them that he was king of the golden mountain and a king's daughter was his wife and that they had a fine son of seven years old. Then said the father, That is certainly not true. It is a fine kind of a king who goes about in a ragged shepherd's coat. On this, the son fell in a passion and without thinking of his promise, turned his ring round and wished both his wife and child with him. They were there in a second, but the queen wept and reproached him and said that he had broken his word and had brought misfortune upon her. He said, I have done it thoughtlessly and not with evil intention and tried to calm her and she pretended to believe this but she had mischief in her mind. Then he led her out of the town into the field and showed her the stream where the little boat had been pushed off and then he said, I am tired, sit down, I will sleep a while on thy lap. And he laid his head on her lap and fell asleep. When he was asleep she first drew the ring from his finger, then she drew away the foot which was under him, leaving only the slipper behind her, and she took her child in her arms and wished herself back in her own kingdom. When he awoke, there he lay quite deserted, and his wife and child were gone, and so was the ring from his finger, the slipper only was still there as a token. Home to thy parents thou canst not return, thought he. They would say that thou wast a wizard. Thou must be off and walk on until thou arrivest in thy own kingdom. So he went away and came at length to a hill by which three giants were standing, disputing with each other because they did not know how to divide their father's property. When they saw him passing by, they called to him and said the little man had quick wits and that he was to divide their inheritance for them. The inheritance, however, consisted of a sword which had this property that if anyone took it in his hand and said, All heads off but mine, every head would lie on the ground. Secondly, of a cloak which made anyone who put it on invisible. Thirdly, of a pair of boots which could transport the wearer to any place he wished in a moment. He said, Give me the three things that I may see if they are still in good condition. They gave him the cloak and when he had put it on he was invisible and changed into a fly. Then he resumed his own form and said, The cloak is a good one, now give me the sword. They said, No, we will not give thee that. If thou were to say, All heads off but mine, 
all our heads would be off, and thou alone wouldst be left with thine. Nevertheless, they gave it to him with the condition that he was only to try it against a tree. This he did, and the sword cut into the trunk of a tree, as if it had been a blade of straw. Then he wanted to have the boots likewise, but they said, No, we will not give them. If thou hadst them on thy feet, and wert to wish thyself at the top of the hill, we should be left down here with nothing. Oh no, said he, I will not do that. So they gave him the boots as well. And now, when he had got all these things, he thought of nothing but his wife and his child, and said as though to himself, Oh, if I were but on the golden mountain! And at the same moment he vanished from the sight of the giants, and thus their inheritance was divided. When he was near his palace, he heard sounds of joy and fiddles and flutes, and the people told him that his wife was celebrating her wedding with another. Then he fell into a rage and said, False woman! She betrayed and deserted me whilst I was asleep. So he put on his cloak and, unseen by all, went into the palace. When he entered the dining hall, a great table was spread with delicious food and the guests were eating and drinking and laughing and jesting. She sat on a royal seat in the midst of them, in splendid apparel, with a crown on her head. He placed himself behind her and no one saw him. When she put a piece of meat on a plate for herself, he took it away and ate it. And when she poured out a glass of wine for herself, he took it away and drank it. She was always helping herself to something and yet she never got anything, for plate and glass disappeared immediately. Then dismayed and ashamed, she arose and went to her chamber and wept, but he followed her there. She said, Has the devil power over me, or did my deliverer never come? Then he struck her in the face and said, Did thy deliverer never come? It is he who has thee in his power, thou traitor. Have I deserved this from thee? Then he made himself visible, went into the hall and cried, the wedding is at an end, the true king has returned. The king's princes and counselors who were assembled there ridiculed and mocked him, but he did not trouble to answer them and said, Will you go away or not? On this they tried to seize him and pressed upon him, but he drew his sword and said, All heads off but mine! and all the heads rolled on the ground, and he alone was master, and once more king of the golden mountain. End of story 92 Story number 93 of Household Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Household Tales by Jacob and William Grimm Translated by Margaret Hunt The Raven There was once upon a time a queen who had a little daughter who was still so young that she had to be carried. One day the child was naughty and the mother might say what she liked but the child would not be quiet. Then she became impatient and as the ravens were flying about the palace she opened the window and said I wish you were a raven and would fly away and then I should have some rest. Scarcely had she spoken the words before the child was changed into a raven and flew from her arms out of the window. It flew into a dark forest and stayed in it a long time, and the parents heard nothing of their child. Then one day a man was on his way through this forest and heard the raven crying and followed the voice. And when he came nearer, the bird said, I am a king's daughter by birth and am bewitched, but thou canst set me free. What am I to do? asked he. She said, Go further into the forest, and thou wilt find a house, wherein sits an aged woman. 
who will offer thee meat and drink, but you must accept nothing. For if you eatest and drinkest anything, thou wilt fall into a sleep, and then thou wilt not be able to deliver me. In the garden behind the house there is a great heap of tan, and on this thou shalt stand and wait for me. For three days I will come every afternoon at two o'clock in a carriage. On the first day four white horses will be harnessed to it, then four chestnut horses, and lastly four black ones. But if thou art not awake but sleeping, I shall not be set free." The man promised to do everything that she desired. But the raven said, Alas, I know already that thou wilt not deliver me. Thou wilt accept something from the woman. Then the man once more promised that he would certainly not touch anything either to eat or to drink. But when he entered the house, the old woman came to him and said, Poor man, how faint you are! Come and refresh yourself, eat and drink. No, said the man, I will not eat or drink. She, however, let him have no peace at all, and said, If you will not eat, take one drink out of the glass, one is nothing. Then he let himself be persuaded and drank. Shortly before two o'clock in the afternoon, he went into the garden to the tan heap to wait for the raven. As he was standing there, his weariness all at once became so great that he could not struggle against it, and lay down for a short time. But he was determined not to go to sleep. Hardly, however, had he lain down, then his eyes closed, of their own accord, and he fell asleep and slept so soundly that nothing in the world could have aroused him. At two o'clock the raven came driving up with four white horses, but she was already in deep grief and said, I know he is asleep. And when she came into the garden, he was indeed lying there asleep on the heap of tan. She alighted from the carriage, went to him, shook him, and called him, but he did not awake. Next day about noon, the old woman came again and brought him food and drink, but he would not take any of it. But she let him have no rest and persuaded him until at length he again took one drink out of the glass. Towards two o'clock he went into the garden to the tan heap to wait for the raven but all at once felt such a great weariness that his limbs would no longer support him. He could not help himself and was forced to lie down and fell into a heavy sleep. When the raven drove up with four brown horses, she was already full of grief and said, I know he is asleep. She went to him, but there he lay sleeping, and there was no wakening him. Next day the old woman asked, What was the meaning of this? He was neither eating nor drinking anything. Did he want to die? He replied, I am not allowed to eat or drink, and will not do so. But she set a dish with food and a glass with wine before him, and when he smelt it he could not resist, and swallowed a deep draught. When the time came he went out into the garden to the heap of tan, and waited for the king's daughter. But he became still more weary than on the day before and lay down and slept as soundly as if he had been a stone. At two o'clock the raven came with four black horses, and the coachman and everything else was black. She was already in the deepest grief and said, I know that he is asleep and cannot deliver me. But when she came to him, there he was lying fast asleep. She shook him and called him, but she could not waken him. Then she laid a loaf beside him, and after that a piece of meat and thirdly a bottle of wine, and he might consume as much of all of them as he liked, but they would never grow less. After this she took a gold ring from her finger and put it on his, and her name was graven on it. Lastly she laid a letter beside him wherein was written what she had given him, and that none of the things would ever grow less. And in it was also written, I see right well that here you will never be able to deliver me. But if thou art still willing to deliver me, come to the golden castle of Stromberg. It lies in thy power, of that I am certain. And when she had given him all of these things, she seated herself in her carriage and drove to the golden castle of Stromberg. When the man awoke and saw that he had slept, he was sad at heart and said, She has certainly driven by, and I have not set her free. Then he perceived the things which were lying beside him, and read the letter wherein was written, how everything had happened. So he arose and went away, intending to go to the golden castle of Stromberg, but he did not know where it was. 
After he walked about the world for a long time, he entered into a dark forest and walked for fourteen days and still could not find his way out. Then it was once more evening and he was so tired that he lay down in a thicket and fell asleep. Next day he went onwards and in the evening, as he was again about to lie down beneath some bushes, he heard such a howling and crying that he could not go to sleep. And at the time when people light the candles, he saw one glimmering, and arose and went towards it. Then he came to a house which seemed very small, for in front of it a great giant was standing. He thought to himself, if I go in and the giant sees me, it will very likely cost me my life. At length he ventured it and went in. When the giant saw him, he said, It is well that thou comest, for it is long since I have eaten. I will at once eat thee for my supper. I'd rather you would leave that alone, said the man. I do not like to be eaten, but if thou hast any desire to eat, I have quite enough here to satisfy thee. If that be true, said the giant, thou mayst be easy. I was only going to devour thee because I had nothing else. Then he went and sat down to the table, and the man took out the bread, wine, and meat, which would never come to an end. This pleases me well, said the giant, and ate to his heart's content. Then the man said to him, Canst thou tell me where the golden castle of Stromberg is? The giant said, I will look at my map. All the towns and villages and the houses are to be found on it. He brought out the map which he had in the room and looked for the castle but it was not to be found on it. It's no matter, said he. I have some still larger maps in my cupboard upstairs, and we will look in them. But there, too, it was in vain. The man now wanted to go onwards, but the giant begged him to wait a few days longer until his brother, who had gone out to bring some provisions, came home. When the brother came home, they inquired about the golden castle of Stromberg. He replied, when I have eaten and, and have had enough, I will look in the map. Then he went with them up to his chamber, and they searched in his map, but could not find it. Then he brought out still older maps, and they never rested until they found the golden castle of Stromberg. But it was many thousand miles away. How am I to get there? asked the man. The giant said, I have two hours time, during which I will carry you into the neighborhood. But after that, I must be at home to suckle the child that we have. So the giant carried the man to about a hundred leagues from the castle and said, Thou canst very well walk the rest of the way alone. And he turned back. But the man went onwards day and night until at length he came to the golden castle of Strom. It stood on a glass mountain, and the bewitched maiden drove in her carriage round the castle, and then went inside. He rejoiced when he saw her and wanted to climb up to her. But when he began to do so, he always slipped down the glass again. And when he saw that he could not reach her, he was filled with trouble and said to himself, I will stay down here below and wait for her. So he built himself a hut and stayed in it for a whole year, and every day saw the king's daughter driving about above, but never could go to her. Then one day he saw from his hut three robbers who were beating each other and cried to them, God be with ye! They stopped when they heard the cry, but as they saw no one, they once again began to beat each other, and that too most dangerously. So he again cried, God be with ye! Again they stopped, looked around, about, but as they saw no one, they went on beating each other. Then he cried for the third time, God be with thee! And thought, I must see what these three are about, and went thither and asked why they were beating each other so furiously. One of them said that he found a stick, and that when he struck a door with it, that door would spring open. The next said that he had found a mantle, and that whenever he put it on, he was invisible. But the third said he had found a horse on which a man could ride everywhere, even up the glass mountain. And now they did not know whether they ought to have these things in common, or whether they ought to divide them. Then the man said, I will give you something in exchange for these three things. Money indeed have I not, but I have other things of more value. But first I must try yours to see if you have told the truth. Then they put him on the horse, threw the mantle round him, and gave him the stick in his hand. And when he had all these things, they were no longer able to see him. 
so he gave them some vigorous blows and cried, Now, vagabonds, you have got what you deserve. Are you satisfied? And he rode up the glass mountain. But when he came in front of the castle at the top, it was shut. Then he struck the door with his stick, and it sprang open immediately. He went in and ascended the stairs until he came to the hall where the maiden was sitting with a golden cup full of wine before her. She, however, could not see him because he had the mantle on. And when he came up to her, he drew from his finger the ring which she had given him, and threw it into the cup so that it rang. Then she cried, That is my ring! So the man who is to set me free must be here! They searched the whole castle and did not find him, but he had gone out and had seated himself on the horse and thrown off the mantle. When they came to the door, they saw him and cried aloud in their delight. Then he alighted and took the king's daughter in his arms. But she kissed him and said, Now hast thou set me free, and tomorrow we will celebrate our wedding. End of story number 93 Read by April 6090, California, United States of America Story 94 of Household Tales The Peasant's Wise Daughter There once was a poor peasant who had no land but only a small house and one daughter. Then said the daughter, We ought to ask our lord the king for a bit of newly cleared land. When the king heard of their poverty, he presented them with a piece of land which she and her father dug up and intended to sow with a little corn and grain of that kind. When they had dug nearly the whole of the field, they found in the earth a mortar made of pure gold. Listen, said the father to the girl, as our lord the king has been so gracious and presented us with the field, we ought to give him this mortar in return for it. The daughter, however, would not consent to this and said, Father, if we have the mortar without having the pestle as well, we shall have to get the pestle, so you had much better say nothing about it. He would, however, not obey her, but took the mortar and carried it to the king, said that he had found it in the cleared land, and asked if he would accept it as a present. The king took the mortar and asked if he had found nothing besides that? No, answered the countryman. Then the king said that he must now bring him the pestle. The peasant said that they had not found that, but he might as well just have spoken to the wind. He was put in prison and was to stay there until he produced the pestle. The servants had daily to carry him bread and water, which is what people get in prison. And they heard how the man cried out continually, Ah, if I had only but listened to my daughter, Alas, alas, if I had but listened to my daughter, and would neither eat nor drink. So he commanded the servants to bring the prisoner before him. And then the king asked the peasant why he was always crying. Ah, if I had but listened to my daughter, and what it was that his daughter had said, she told me that I ought to not take the mortar to you, for I should have to produce the pestle as well. If you have a daughter who is as wise as that, let her come here. She was therefore obliged to appear before the king, who asked if she really was so wise, and said he would set her a riddle, and if she could guess that, he would marry her. She at once said yes, she would guess it. Then said the king, Come to me not clothed, not naked, not riding, not walking, not in the road, not out of the road, and if thou canst do that, I will marry thee. So she went away, put off everything she had on, and then she was not clothed, and took a great fishing net, and seated herself in it, and wrapped it entirely round and round her so that she was not naked. And she hired an ass and tied the fisherman's net to its tail so that it was forced to drag her along. And that was neither riding nor walking. The ass had to drag her in the ruts so that she only touched the ground 
with her great toe. And that was neither being in the road nor out of the road. And when she arrived in that fashion, the king said she had guessed the riddle and fulfilled all the conditions. Then he ordered her father to be released from the prison, took her to wife, and gave into her care all the royal possessions. Now, when some years had passed, the king was once drawing up his troops on parade, when it happened that some peasants who had been selling wood stopped with their wagons before the palace. Some of them had oxen yoked to them and some horses. There was one peasant who had three horses, one of which was delivered of a young foal, and it ran away and lay down between two oxen which were in front of the wagon. When the peasants came together, they began to dispute, to beat each other and make a disturbance. And the peasant with the oxen wanted to keep the foal, and said one of the oxen had given birth to it, and the other said his horse had had it, and that it was his. The quarrel came before the king, and he gave the verdict that the foal should stay where it had been found. And so the peasant with the oxen, to whom it did not belong, got it. Then the other went away, and wept and lamented over his foal. Now he had heard how gracious his lady the queen was, because she herself had sprung from poor peasant folks. So he went to her and begged her to see if she could not help him to get his foal back again. She said, Yes, yes, I will tell you what to do. If thou wilt promise not to betray me, early tomorrow morning when the king parades the guard, place thyself in the middle of the road by which he must pass. Take a great fishing net and pretend to be fishing. Go on fishing too, and empty out the net as if thou hast got it full. And then she told him also what he was to say if he was questioned by the king. The next day, therefore, the peasant stood there and fished on dry ground. When the king passed by and saw that, sent his messenger to ask what the stupid man was about. He answered, I am fishing. The messenger asked how he could fish where there was no water there. The peasant said, It's easy for me to fish on dry land as it is for an ox to have a foal. The messenger went back and took the answer to the king, who ordered the peasant to be brought to him and told him, that this was not his own idea, and he wanted to know whose it was. The peasant must confess this at once. The peasant, however, would not do so, and said always, God forbid he should. The idea was his own. They laid him, however, on a heap of straw, and beat him and tormented him so long that at last he admitted that he had got the idea from the queen. When the king reached home again and said to his wife, Why hast thou behaved so falsely to me? I will not have thee any longer for a wife. Thy time is up. Go back to the place where whence thou camest to thy peasant's hut. One favor, however, he granted her. She might take with her one thing that was dearest and best in her eyes, and thus was she dismissed. She said, Yes, my dear husband. If you command this, I will do it. And she embraced him and kissed him, and said she would take leave of him. Then she ordered a powerful sleeping draught to be brought, to drink farewell to him. The king took a long draught, but she took only a little. He soon fell into a deep sleep, and when she perceived that, she called a servant and took a fair white linen cloth and wrapped the king in it, and the servant was forced to carry him into a carriage that stood before the door, and she drove with him to her own little house. She laid him in her own little bed. He slept one day and one night without awakening, and when he awoke he looked round and said, Good God, where am I? He called his attendants, but none of them were there. At length his wife came to his bedside and said, my dear lord and king, you told me I might bring away with me from the palace that which was dearest and most precious in my eyes. I have nothing more precious and dear than yourself. 
so I have brought you with me. Tears rose to the king's eyes. He said, Dear wife, thou shalt be mine, and I will be thine. And he took her back with him to the royal palace, and was married again to her. And at the present time, they are very likely still living. End of story 94 Story 95 of Household Tales Once upon a time lived a peasant and his wife, and the parson of the village had a fancy for the wife, and had wished for a long while to spend a whole day happily with her. The peasant woman, too, was quite willing. One day, therefore, he said to the woman, Listen, my dear friend, I have now thought of a way by which we can, for once, spend a whole day happily together. I tell you what, on Wednesday you must take to your bed and tell your husband you are ill, and if you only complain and act being ill properly, and go on doing so until Sunday when I have to preach, I will then say in my sermon that whosoever has at home a sick child, a sick husband, a sick wife, a sick father, a sick mother, a sick brother, or whosoever else it may be, and makes a pilgrimage to the Gockerly Hill in Italy, where you can get a peck of laurel leaves for a cruiser, the sick child, the sick husband, the sick wife, the sick father, the sick mother, the sick sister, or whoever else it may be, will be restored to health immediately. I will manage it, said the woman promptly. Now, therefore, on the Wednesday, the peasant woman took to her bed and complained and lamented as agreed on, and her husband did everything for her that he could think of, but nothing did her any good. And when Sunday came, the woman said, I feel as ill as if I were going to die at once, but there is one thing I should like to do before my end. I should like to hear the parson's sermon that he is going to preach today. On that the peasant said, Ah, my child, do not do it. Thou mightest make thyself worse if thou wert to get up. Look, I will go to the sermon, and I will attend to it very carefully, and will tell thee everything the parson says. Well, said the woman, go then and pay great attention, and repeat to me all that thou hearest. So the peasant went to the sermon, and the parson began to preach and said, If anyone had at home a sick child, a sick husband, a sick wife, a sick father, a sick mother, a sick sister, brother, or anyone else, and would make a pilgrimage to the Gockerly Hill in Italy, where a peck of laurel leaves costs a cruiser, the sick child, sick husband, sick wife, sick father, sick mother, sick sister, brother, or whoever else it might be, would be restored to health and instantly. And whosoever wished to undertake the journey was to go to him after the service was over, and he would give him the sack for the laurel leaves and the cruiser. Then no one was more rejoiced than the peasant, and after the service was over, he went at once to the parson who gave him the bag for the laurel leaves and the cruiser. After he went home, and even at the house door, he cried, Hurrah, dear wife! It is now almost the same thing as if thou wert well. The parson has preached today that whosoever had at home, a sick child, a sick husband, a sick wife, a sick father, a sick mother, a sick sister, brother, or whoever it might be, and would make a pilgrimage to the Gockerly Hill in Italy, where a peck of laurel leaves cost a cruiser, a sick child, sick husband, sick wife, sick father, sick mother, sick sister, brother, or whosoever else it was, would be cured immediately. And now I have already got the bag for the cruiser from the parson, and will at once begin my journey, so that thou mayest get well the faster. And thereupon he went away. He was, however, hardly gone before the woman got up, and the parson was there directly. But now... We will leave these two for a while, and follow the peasant, who walked on quickly without stopping, in order to get the sooner to the Gockerly Hill, and on his way he met his gossip. His gossip was an egg merchant, and was just coming from the market, where he had sold his eggs. May you be blessed, said the gossip, 
Where are you off to so fast? To all eternity, my friend, said the peasant. My wife is ill, and I have begun today to hear the parson's sermon. And he preached that if anyone had in his house a sick child, a sick husband, a sick wife, a sick father, a sick mother, a sick sister, brother, or anyone else, and made a pilgrimage to the Gawkerly Hill in Italy, where a pack of laurel leaves cost a cruiser, the sick child, the sick husband, the sick wife, the sick fathers, the sick mother, the sick sister, brother, or whosoever else it was, would be cured immediately. And so I have got the bag for the laurel leaves and the cruiser from the parson, and now I am beginning my pilgrimage. But listen, gossip, said the egg merchant to the peasant, are you then stupid enough to believe such a thing as that? Don't you know what it means? The parson wants to spend a whole day alone with your wife in peace, so he has given you this job to do to get you out of the way. My word, said the peasant, how I'd like to know if that's true. Come then, said the gossip, I'll tell you what to do. Get into my egg basket and I will carry you home, and then you will see for yourself. So that was settled, and the gossip put the peasant into his egg basket and carried him home. When they got to the house, hurrah! But all was going merrily there. The woman had already had nearly everything killed that was in the farmyard, and had made pancakes, and the parson was there, and had brought his fiddle with him. The gossip knocked at the door, and the woman asked, Who's there? It is I, gossip, said the egg merchant. Give me shelter this night. I have not sold my eggs at the market, so now I have to carry them home again, and they are so heavy that I shall never be able to do it, for it is dark already. Indeed, my friend, said the woman, thou comest at a very inconvenient time for me, but as thou art here, it cannot be helped. Come in and take a seat there on the bench by the stove. Then she placed the gossip and the basket, which he carried on his back, on the bench by the stove. The parson, however, and the woman were as merry as possible. At length the parson said, Listen, my friend, thou canst sing beautifully. Sing something to me. Oh, said the woman, I cannot sing now. In my young days, indeed, I could sing well enough, but that's all over now. Come, said the parson once more, do sing some little song. On that, the woman began and sang, I've sent my husband away from me to the Gawkerly Hill in Italy. Thereupon the parson sang, I wish twas a year before he came back. I'd never ask him for the laurel leaf sack. Hallelujah. Then the gossip, who was in the background, began to sing. But I ought to tell you, the peasant was called Hildebrand. So the gossip sang, What art thou doing, my Hildebrand dear, there on the bench by the stove so near? Hallelujah! And then the peasant sang from his basket, All sing, I ever shall hate from this day, and here in this basket no longer I'll stay. Hallelujah! And he got out of the basket and cudgeled the parson out of the house. End of story 95 Story 96 of Household Tales The Three Little Birds About a thousand or more years ago, there were in this country nothing but small kings, and one of them who lived on the Kuteberg was very fond of hunting. Once on a time, when he was riding forth from his castle with his huntsmen, three girls were watching their cows upon the mountain. And when they saw the king with all his followers, the eldest girl pointed to him and called to the other two girls, If I do not get that one, I will have none. Then the second girl answered from the other side of the hill and pointed to the one who was on the king's right hand, Hello, hello, if I do not get him, I will have no one. These, however, were the two ministers. The king heard all this, and when he had come back from the chase, he caused the three girls to be brought to him, and asked them what they had said yesterday on the mountain. This they would not tell him. So the king asked the eldest if she really would take him for her husband. Then she said yes, and the two ministers married the two sisters, for they were all three fair and beautiful of face, 
especially the queen, who had hair like flax. But the two sisters had no children, and once when the king was obliged to go from home, he invited them to come to the queen in order to cheer her, for she was about to bear a child. She had a little boy, who brought a bright red star into the world with him. Then the two sisters said to each other that they would throw the beautiful boy into the water. When they had thrown him in, I believe it was into the Vesar, a little bird flew up into the air, which sang, To thy death art thou sped, until God's word be said. In the white lily bloom, brave boy, is thy tomb. When the two heard that, they were frightened to death, and ran away in great haste. When the king came home, they told him that the queen had been delivered of a dog. And the king said, What God does is well done. But a fisherman who dwelt near the water fished the little boy out again while he was still alive. And, as his wife had no children, they reared him. When a year had gone by, the king again went away, and the queen had another little boy whom the false sisters likewise took and threw into the water. Then up flew a little bird again and sang, To thy death art thou sped, until God's word be said, In the white lily bloom brave boy is thy tomb. And when the king came back, they told him that the queen had once more given birth to a dog, and he again said, What God does is well done. The fisherman, however, fished this one also out of the water and reared him. Then the king again journeyed forth, and the queen had a little girl, whom also the false sisters threw into the water. Then again, a little bird flew up on high and sang, To thy death art thou sped, until God's word be said, In the white lily bloom, bonny girl, is thy tomb. And when the king came home, they told him that the queen had been delivered of a cat. Then the king grew angry and ordered his wife to be cast into prison, and therein was she shut up for many long years. In the meantime, the children had grown up. Then eldest once went out with some other boys to fish, but the other boys would not have him with them, and said, Go thy way, foundling. Hereupon he was much troubled, and asked the old fisherman if that was true. The fisherman told him that once when he was fishing he had drawn him out of the water. So the boy said he would go forth and seek his father. The fisherman, however, entreated him to stay, but he would not let himself be hindered, and at last the fisherman consented. Then the boy went on his way and walked for many days, and at last he came to a great piece of water by the side of which stood an old woman fishing. Good day, mother, said the boy. Many thanks, said she. Thou wilt fish long enough before thou catchest anything, and thou wilt seek long enough before thou findest thy father. How wilt thou get over the water, said the woman. God knows. Then the old woman took him up on her back and carried him through it, and he sought for a long time, but could not find his father. When a year had gone by, the second boy set out to seek his brother. He came to the water, and all fared with him just as with his brother, and now there was no one at home but the daughter, and she mourned for her brothers so much that at last she also begged the fisherman to let her set forth, for she wished to go in search of her brothers. Then she likewise came to the great piece of water, and she said to the old woman, Good day, mother. Many thanks, replied the old woman. May God help you with your fishing, said the maiden. When the old woman heard that, she became quite friendly, and carried her over the water, gave her a wand, and said to her, Go, my daughter, ever onwards by this road, and when you come to a great black dog, you must pass it silently and boldly, without either laughing or looking at it. Then you will come to a great high castle, on the threshold of which you must let the wand fall, and go straight through the castle and out again on the other side. There you will see an old fountain, out of which a large tree has grown, whereon hangs a bird in a cage which you must take down. 
take likewise a glass of water out of the fountain, and with these two things go back by the same way, pick up the wand again from the threshold and take it with you, and when you again pass by the dog, strike him in the face with it, but be sure that you hit him, and then just come back here to me. The maiden found everything exactly as the old woman had said, and on her way back she found her two brothers, who had sought each other over half the world. They went together to the place where the black dog was lying on the road. She struck it in the face, and it turned into a handsome prince, who went with them to the river. There the old woman was still standing. She rejoiced much to see them again, and carried them all over the water, and then she too went away, for now she was freed. The others, however, went to the old fisherman, and all were glad that they had found each other again, but they hung the bird on the wall. But the second son could not settle at home, and took his crossbow and went to hunting. When he was tired, he took his flute and made music. The king was hunting too, and heard that, and went thither, and when he met the youth, he said, Who has given thee leave to hunt here? Oh, no one. To whom dost thou belong, then? I am the fisherman's son. But he has no children. If thou wilt not believe, come with me. That the king did, and questioned the fisherman who told everything to him, and the little bird on the wall began to sing. The mother sits alone, there in the prison small, O king of royal blood, these are thy children all. The sisters twain so false, they wrought the children woe, there in the waters deep, where the fishermen come and go. Then they were all terrified, and the king took the bird, the fishermen, and the three children back with him to the castle, and ordered the prison to be opened, and brought his wife out again. She had, however, grown quite ill and weak. Then the daughter gave her some of the water from the fountain to drink, and she became strong and healthy. But the two false sisters were burnt, and the daughter married the prince. End of story 96. Story 97 of Household Tales the Water of Life There was once a king who had an illness, and no one believed that he would come out of it with his life. He had three sons who were much distressed about it, and went down into the palace garden and wept. There they met an old man who inquired as to the cause of their grief. They told him that their father was so ill that he would most certainly die for nothing seemed to cure him. Then the old man said, I know of one more remedy, and that is the water of life. If he drinks of it, he will become well again, but it is hard to find. The eldest said, I will manage to find it, and went to the sick king and begged to be allowed to go forth in search of the water of life for that alone could save him. No, said the king, the danger is too great. I would rather die. But he begged so long that the king consented. The prince thought in his heart, if I bring the water, then I shall be best beloved of my father and shall inherit the kingdom. So he set out, and when he had ridden forth a little distance, a dwarf stood there in the road who called to him and said, whither away so fast. Silly shrimp, said the prince, very haughtily, it is nothing to do with you, and rode on. But the little dwarf had grown angry, and had wished an evil wish. Soon after this the prince entered a ravine, and the further he rode, the closer the mountains drew together. And at last the road became so narrow that he could not advance a step further. It was impossible either to turn his horse or to dismount from the saddle, and he was shut in there as if in prison. The sick king waited long for him, but he came not. Then the second son said, 
Father, let me go forth to seek the water. And thought to himself, If my brother is dead, then the kingdom will fall to me. At first the king would not allow him to go either, but at last he yielded. So the prince set out on the same road that his brother had taken. And he too met the dwarf who stopped him and asked, whether he was going in such haste. Little shrimp, said the prince, that is nothing to thee, and rode on without giving him another look. But the dwarf bewitched him, and he, like the other, rode into a ravine, and could neither go forwards nor backwards. So fair, haughty people. As the second son also remained away, the youngest begged to be allowed to go forth to fetch the water, and at last the king was obliged to let him go. When he met the dwarf, and the latter asked him whither he was going in such haste, he stopped, gave him an explanation, and said, I am seeking the water of life, for my father is sick unto death. Dost thou know then where that is to be found? No, said the prince, as thou hast borne thyself as is seemly, and not haughtily like thy false brothers, I will give thee the information and tell thee how thou mayest obtain the water of life. It springs from a fountain in the courtyard of an enchanted castle. Thou wilt not be able to make thy way to it if I do not give thee an iron wand and two small loaves of bread. Strike thrice with the wand on the iron door of the castle, and it will spring open. Inside lie two lions with gaping jaws, but if thou throwest a loaf to each of them, they will be quieted. Then hasten to fetch some of the water of life before the clock strikes twelve, else the door will shut again and thou wilt be imprisoned. The prince thanked him, took the wand and the bread, and set out on his way. When he arrived, everything was as the dwarf had said. The door sprang open at the third stroke of the wand, and when he had appeased the lions with the bread, he entered the castle, and came to a large and splendid hall, wherein sat some enchanted princes, whose rings he drew off their fingers. A sword and a loaf of bread were lying there, which he carried away. After this he entered a chamber, in which was a beautiful maiden, who rejoiced when she saw him, kissed him, and told him that he had delivered her, and should have the whole of her kingdom, and that, if he would return in a year, their wedding should be celebrated. Likewise she told him where the spring of water of life was, and that he was to hasten and draw some of it before the clock struck twelve. Then he went onwards, and at last entered a room where there was a beautiful, newly made bed. And as he was very weary, he felt inclined to rest a little. So he lay down and fell asleep. When he awoke, it was striking a quarter to twelve. He sprang up in fright, ran to the spring, drew some water in a cup which stood near, and hastened away. But just as he was passing through the iron door, the clock struck twelve, and the door fell to with such violence that it carried away a piece of his heel. He, however, rejoicing at having obtained the water of life, went homewards, and again passed the dwarf. When the latter saw the sword and the loaf, he said, With these thou hast won great wealth. With the sword thou canst slay whole armies, and the bread will never come to an end. But the prince would not go home to his father without his brothers, and said, Dear dwarf, canst thou not tell me where my two brothers are? They went out before I did in search of the water of life, and have not returned. They are imprisoned between two mountains, said the dwarf. I have condemned them to stay there, because they were haughty. Then the prince begged until the dwarf released them, and he warmed him, however, and said, Beware of them, for they have bad hearts. When his brothers came, he rejoiced and told them how things had gone with him, that he had found the water of life and had brought a cup full away with him, and had rescued a beautiful princess who was willing to wait a year for him 
and then their wedding was to be celebrated, and he would obtain a great kingdom. After that they rode on together, and chanced upon the land where war and famine reigned, and the king already thought he must perish, for the scarcity was so great. Then the prince went to him and gave him the loaf, wherewith he fed and satisfied the whole of his kingdom. And then the prince gave him the sword also, wherewith he slew the hosts of his enemies, and could now live in rest and peace. The prince then took back his loaf and his sword, and the three brothers rode on. But after this they entered two more countries, where war and famine reigned, and each time the prince gave his loaf and his sword to the kings, and had now delivered three kingdoms. And after that they went on board a ship and sailed over the sea. During the passage, the two eldest conversed apart and said, The youngest has found the water of life, and not we. For that, our Father will give him the kingdom, the kingdom which belongs to us, and he will rob us of all our fortune. They then began to seek revenge and plotted with each other to destroy him. They waited until they found him fast asleep. Then they poured the water of life out of the cup and took it for themselves. But into the cup they poured salt sea water. Now, therefore, when they arrived home, the youngest took his cup to the sick king in order that he might drink out of it and be cured. But scarcely had he drunk a very little of the salt sea water than he became still worse than before. And as he was lamenting over this, the two eldest brothers came and accused the youngest of having intended to poison him, and said that they had brought him the true water of life and handed it to him. He had scarcely tasted it when he felt his sickness departing and became strong and healthy as in the days of his youth. After that they both went to the youngest, mocked him, and said, You certainly found the water of life, but you have had the pain and we the gain. You should have been sharper and should have kept your eyes open. We took it from you whilst you were asleep at sea, and when the year is over, one of us will go and fetch the beautiful princess. But beware that you do not disclose aught of this to our father. Indeed, he does not trust you. And if you say a single word, you shall lose your life into the bargain. But if you keep silent, you shall have it as a gift. The old king was angry with his youngest son, and thought he had plotted against his life. So he summoned the court together, and had sentence pronounced upon his son, that he should be secretly shot. And once, when the prince was riding forth to the chase, suspecting no evil, the king's huntsman had to go with him. And when they were quite alone in the forest, the huntsman looked so sorrowful that the prince said to him, Dear huntsman, what ails you? The huntsman said, I cannot tell you, and yet I ought. Then the prince said, Say openly what it is, I will pardon you. Alas, said the huntsman, I am to shoot you dead. The king has ordered me to do it. Then the prince was shocked and said, Dear huntsman, let me live. There, I give you my royal garments. Give me your common ones in their stead. The huntsman said, I will willingly do that. Indeed, I should not have been able to shoot you. Then they exchanged clothes, and the huntsman entered the home. The prince, however, went further into the forest. After a time, three wagons of gold and precious stones came to the king for his youngest son, which were sent by the three kings who had slain their enemies with the prince's sword and maintained their people with his bread and who wished to show their gratitude for it. The old king then thought, Can my son have been innocent? And said to his people, Would that he were still alive! How it grieves me that I have suffered him to be killed! He still lives, said the huntsman. I could not find it in my heart to carry out your command, 
and told the king how it had happened. Then a stone fell from the king's heart, and he had it proclaimed in every country that his son might return and be taken into favor again. The princess, however, had a road made up to her palace which was quite bright and golden, and told her people that whosoever came riding straight along it to her would be the right wooer and was to be admitted, and whoever rode by the side of it was not the right one and was not to be admitted. As the time was now close at hand, the eldest thought he would hasten to go to the king's daughter and give himself out as her deliverer, and thus win her for his bride and the kingdom to boot. Therefore he rode forth, and when he arrived in front of the palace, he saw the splendid golden road and thought, it would be a sin and a shame if I were to ride over that, and turned aside, and rode on the right side of it. But when he came to the door, the servants told him that he was not the right man, and was to go away. Soon after this, the second prince set out, and when he came to the golden road, and his horse had put one foot on it, he thought, it would be a sin and a shame to tread a piece of it off. And he turned aside and rode on the left side of it. And when he reached the door, the attendants told him he was not the right one, and he was to go away. When at last the year had entirely expired, the third son likewise wished to ride out of the forest to his beloved and with her forget his sorrows. So he set out and thought of her so incessantly and wished to be with her so much that he never noticed the golden road at all. So his horse rode onwards up the middle of it. And when he came to the door, it was opened and the princess received him with joy and said he was her deliverer and the lord of the kingdom and their wedding was celebrated with great rejoicing. When it was over, she told him that his father invited him to come to him, and had forgiven him. So he rode thither, and told him everything, how his brothers had betrayed him, and how he had nevertheless kept silence. The old king wished to punish them, but they had put to sea, and never came back as long as they lived. End of Story 97 Story 98 of Household Tales there was once upon a time a poor peasant called Crab, who drove with two oxen a load of wood to the town, and sold it to a doctor for two thalers. When the money was being counted out to him, it so happened that the doctor was sitting at table, and when the peasant saw how daintily he ate and drank, his heart desired what he saw, and he would willingly have been a doctor too. So he remained standing a while, and at length inquired if he too could not become a doctor. Oh yes, said the doctor. That is soon managed. What must I do? asked the peasant. In the first place, buy thyself an ABC book of the kind which has a cock on the frontispiece. In second, turn thy cart and thy oxen into money, and get thyself some clothes, and whatever else pertains to medicine. Thirdly, have a sign painted for thyself with the words, I am Dr. Knowall, and have that nailed up above thy house door. The peasant did everything that he had been told to do. When he had doctored people a while, but not long, a rich and great lord had some money stolen. Then he was told about Dr. Knowall, who lived in such and such a village, and must know what had become of the money. So the lord had the horses put in his carriage, drove out to the village, and asked Crab if he were Dr. Knowall. Yes, he was, he said. Then he was to go with him and bring back the stolen money. Oh yes, but... Greta, my wife, must go too. The Lord was willing and let both of them have a seat in the carriage, and they all drove away together. When they came to the nobleman's castle, the table was spread, and Crab was told to sit down and eat. Yes, but my wife, Greta too, he said, and seated himself with her at the table. And when the first servant came with a dish of delicate fare, the peasant nudged his wife and said, Greta, that was the first meaning that was the servant who brought the first dish. The servant, however, thought he intended by that to say, that is the first thief, and as he actually was so, he was terrified and said to his comrade outside, 
The doctor knows all. We shall fare ill. He said I was the first. The second did not want to go in at all, but was forced. When he went in with his dish, the peasant nudged his wife and said, Greta, that is the second. This servant was just as much alarmed, and he got out. The third did not fare better, for the peasant again said, Greta, that is the third. The fourth had to carry in a dish that was covered, and the lord told the doctor that he was to show his skill and guess what was beneath the cover. The doctor looked at the dish, had no idea what to say, and cried, Ah, poor crab! When the lord heard that, he cried, There! He knows it! He knows who has the money! On this, the servants looked terribly uneasy, and made a sign to the doctor that they wished him to step outside for a moment. When therefore he went out, all four of them confessed to him that they had stolen the money, and said that they would willingly restore it and give him a heavy sum into the bargain, if he would not denounce them, for if they did, they would be hanged. They led him to the spot where the money was concealed. With this, the doctor was satisfied, and returned to the hall, sat down to the table, and said, My lord, now I will search in my book where the gold is hidden. The fifth servant, however, crept into the stove to hear if the doctor knew still more. The doctor, however, sat still and opened his ABC book, turned the pages backwards and forwards, and looked for the cock. As he could not find it immediately, he said, I know you are there, so you had better show yourself. Then the fellow in the stove thought that the doctor met him, and, full of terror, sprang out, crying, That man knows everything! Then Dr. Knowall showed the count where the money was, but did not say who had stolen it, and received from both sides much money in reward, and became a renowned man. End of story number 98 Story number 99 of Household Tales The Spirit in the Bottle There was once a poor woodcutter who toiled from early morning till late night, when at last he had laid by some money, he said to his boy, You are my only child. I will spend the money which I have earned with the sweat of my brow on your education. If you learn some honest trade, you can support me in my old age, when my limbs have grown stiff and I am obliged to stay at home. Then the boy went to a high school and learned diligently, so that his masters praised him and he remained there a long time. When he had worked through two classes, but was still not yet perfect in everything, the little pittance which the father had earned was all spent, and the boy was obliged to return home to him. Ah, said the father, sorrowfully, I can give you no more, and in these hard times I cannot earn a farthing more than will suffice for our daily bread. Dear father, answered the son, don't trouble yourself about it. If it is God's will, it will turn to my advantage. I shall soon accustom myself to it. When the father wanted to go into the forest to earn money by helping to pile and stack wood and also chop it, the son said, I will go with you and help you. Nay, my son, said the father, that would be hard for you. You are not accustomed to rough work, and will not be able to bear it. Besides, I have only one axe, and no money left wherewith to buy another. Just go to the neighbour, answered the son. He will lend you his axe, until I have earned one for myself. The father then borrowed an axe of the neighbour, and next morning at break of day they went out into the forest together. The son helped his father and was quite merry and brisk about it. But when the son was right over their heads, the father said, We will rest and have our dinner, and then we shall work as well again. The son took his bread in his hands and said, Just you rest, father, I am not tired. I will walk up and down a little in the forest and look for birds' nests. Oh, you fool, said the father. Why should you want to run about there? Afterwards you will be tired and no longer able to raise your arm. Stay here and sit down beside me. The son, however, went into the forest, ate his bread, was very merry and peered in among the green branches to see if he could discover a bird's nest anywhere. 
So he went up and down to see if he could find a bird's nest, until, at last, he came to a great, dangerous-looking oak, which certainly was already many hundred years old, and which five men could not have spanned. He stood still and looked at it, and thought, Many a bird must have built its nest in that. Then, all at once, it seemed to him that he heard a voice. He listened, and became aware that someone was crying in a very smothered voice, Let me out! Let me out! He looked around, but could discover nothing. Nevertheless, he fancied that the voice came out of the ground. Then he cried, Where art thou? The voice answered, I am down here, amongst the roots of the oak tree. Let me out! Let me out! The scholar began to loosen the earth under the tree and search among the roots, until at last he found a glass bottle in a little hollow. He lifted it up and held it against the light, and then saw a creature shaped like a frog springing up and down in it. Let me out! Let me out! it cried anew, and the scholar, thinking no evil, drew the cork out of the bottle. Immediately a spirit ascended from it, and began to grow, and grew so fast that in a very few moments he stood before the scholar, a terrible fellow, as big as half the tree by which he was standing. Knowest thou, he cried, in an awful voice, what thy wages are for having let me out? No, replied the scholar, fearlessly, how should I know that? Then I will tell thee, cried the spirit, I must strangle thee for it. Thou shouldst have told me that sooner, said the scholar, for I should then have left thee shut up, but my head shall stand fast for all thou canst do. More persons than one must be consulted about that. More persons here, more persons there, said the spirit. Thou shalt have the wages thou hast earned. Dost thou think that I was shut up there for such a long time as a favour? No, it was a punishment for me. I am the mighty Mercurius. Whoso releases me, him must I strangle. Softly, answered the scholar, not so fast. I must first know that thou really wert shut up in that little bottle, and that thou art the right spirit. If indeed thou canst get in again, I will believe, and then thou mayest do as thou wilt with me. The spirit said, haughtily, That is a very trifling feat, drew himself together, and made himself as small and slender as he had been at first, so that he crept through the same opening, and right through the neck of the bottle in again. Scarcely was he within than the scholar thrust the cork he had drawn back into the bottle, and threw it among the roots of the oak into its old place, and the spirit was betrayed. And now the scholar was about to return to his father, but the spirit cried very piteously, Ah, oh, do let me out! Ah, oh, do let me out! No, answered the scholar, not a second time. He who has once tried to take my life shall not be set free by me, now that I have caught him again. If thou wilt set me free, said the spirit, I will give thee so much that thou wilt have plenty all the days of thy life. No, answered the boy, thou wouldst cheat me as thou didst the first time. Thou art playing away with thy own good luck, said the spirit. I will do thee no harm, but will reward thee richly. The scholar thought, I will venture it, perhaps he will keep his word, and anyhow he shall not get the better of me. Then he took out the cork, and the spirit rose up from the bottle as he had done before, stretched himself out, and became as big as a giant. Now thou shalt have thy reward, said he, and handed the scholar a little bag just like a plaster, and said, If thou spreadest one end of this over a wound, it will heal, and if thou rubbest steel or iron with the other end, it will be changed into silver. I must just try that, said the scholar, and went to a tree, tore off the bark with his axe, and rubbed it with one end of the plaster. 
it immediately closed together and was healed. Now it is all right, he said to the spirit, and we can part. The spirit thanked him for his release, and the boy thanked the spirit for his present, and went back to his father. Where hast thou been racing about? said the father. Why hast thou forgotten thy work? I said at once that thou wouldst never get on with anything. Be easy, father, I will make it up. Make it up indeed, said the father angrily. There's no art in that. Take care, father, I will soon hew that tree there, so that it will split. Then he took his plaster, rubbed the axe with it, and dealt a mighty blow, but as the iron had changed into silver, the edge turned. Hello, father, just look what a bad axe you've given me. It has become quite crooked. The father was shocked and said, Ah, what hast thou done? Now I shall have to pay for that and have not the wherewithal, and that is all the good I have got by thy work. Don't get angry, said the son, I will soon pay for the axe. Oh, thou blockhead, cried the father, wherewith wilt thou pay for it? Thou hast nothing but what I give thee. These are students' tricks that are sticking in thy head, but thou hast no idea of woodcutting. After a while the scholar said, Father, I can really work no more. We had better take a holiday. Eh, what? answered he. Dost thou think I will sit with my hands lying in my lap like thee? I must go on working, but thou mayest take thyself off home. Father, I am here in this wood for the first time. I don't know my way alone. Do go with me. As his anger had now abated, the father at last let himself be persuaded and went home with him. Then he said to the son, Go and sell thy damaged axe and see what thou canst get for it, and I must earn the difference in order to pay the neighbour. The son took the axe and carried it into town to a goldsmith, who tested it, laid it in the scales and said, It is worth four hundred talers. I have not so much as that by me. The son said, Give me what thou hast, I will lend you the rest. The goldsmith gave him three hundred talers, and remained a hundred in his debt. The son thereupon went home and said, Father, I have got the money, go and ask the neighbour what he wants for the axe. I know that already, answered the old man, one taler, six groschen. Then give him two talers, twelve groschen, that is double and enough. See, I have money in plenty. And he gave the father a hundred talers, and said, You shall never know want, live as comfortably as you like. Good heavens, said the father, how hast thou come by these riches? The scholar then told how all had come to pass, and how he, trusting in his luck, had made such a good hit. But with the money that was left, he went back to the high school and went on learning more, and as he could heal all wounds with his plaster, he became the most famous doctor in the whole world. End of story number 99 Story 100 of Household Tales The Devil's Sooty Brother a disbanded soldier had nothing to live on and did not know how to get on. So he went out into the forest and when he had walked for a short time, he met a little man who was, however, the devil. The little man said to him, What ails you? You seem so very sorrowful. Then the soldier said, I am hungry, but have no money. The devil said, if you will hire yourself to me and be my serving man, you shall have enough for all your life. You shall serve me for seven years, and after that you shall again be free. But one thing I must tell you, and that is, you must not wash, comb, or trim yourself, or cut your hair or nails, or wipe the water from your eyes. The soldier said, all right, if there's no help for it, and went off with the little man 
who straightway led him down into hell. Then he told him what he had to do. He was to poke the fire under the kettles wherein the hell broth was stewing, keep the house clean, drive all the sweepings behind the doors, and see that everything was in order. But if he once peeped into the kettles, it would go ill with him. The soldier said, Good, I will take care. And then the old devil went out again on his wanderings, and the soldier entered upon his new duties, made the fire and swept the dirt well behind the doors, just as he had been bidden. When the old devil came back again, he looked to see if all had been done, appeared satisfied, and went forth a second time. The soldier now took a good look on every side. The kettles were standing all round hell with a mighty fire below them, and inside they were boiling and sputtering. He would have given anything to look inside them, if the devil had not so particularly forbidden him. At last, he could no longer restrain himself, slightly raised the lid of the first kettle and peeped in. And there, he saw his former corporal shut in. Aha, old bird, said he, do I meet you here? You once had me in your power, now I have you. And he quickly let the lid fall, poked the fire and added a fresh log. After that, he went to the second kettle raised its lid also a little and peeped in. His former ensign was in that. Aha, old bird, so I find you here. You once had me in your power, and now I have you. He closed the lid again and fetched yet another log to make it really hot. Then he wanted to see who might be sitting up in the third kettle. It was actually a general. Aha, old bird, do I meet you here? Once you had me in your power, now I have you. And he fetched the bellows and made hellfire blaze right under him. So he did his work seven years in hell, did not wash, comb or trim himself, or cut his hair or nails, or wash the water out of his eyes. And the seven years seemed so short to him that he thought he had only been half a year. Now when the time had fully gone by, the devil came and said, well, Hans, what have you done? I poked the fire under the kettles, and I have swept all the dirt well behind the doors. But you have peeped into the kettles as well. It is lucky for you that you added fresh logs to them, or else your life would have been forfeited. Now that your time is up, will you go home again? Yes, said the soldier. I should very much like to see what my father is doing at home. The devil said, In order that you may receive the wages you have earned, go and fill your knapsack full of the sweepings and take it home with you. You must also go unwashed and uncombed, with long hair on your head and beard, and with uncut nails and dim eyes. And when you are asked whence you come, you must say, From hell. And when you are asked who you are, you are to say, the devil's sooty brother, and my king as well. The soldier held his peace and did as the devil bade him, but he was not at all satisfied with his wages. Then as soon as he was up in the forest again, he took his knapsack from his back to empty it, but on opening it, the sweepings had become pure gold. I should never have expected that said he and was well pleased, and entered the town. The landlord was standing in front of the inn, and when he saw the soldier approaching, he was terrified, because Hans looked so horrible, worse than a scarecrow. He called to him and asked, Whence comest thou? From hell. Who art thou? The devil's sooty brother, and my king as well. Then the host would not let him enter, but when Hans showed him the gold, he came and unlatched the door himself. Hans then ordered the best room and attendance, ate and drank his fill, but neither washed nor combed himself, as the devil had bidden him, and at last lay down to sleep. But the knapsack full of gold remained before the eyes of the landlord, and left him no peace, and during the night he crept in and stole it away. Next morning, however, when Hans got up and wanted to pay the landlord and travel further, Behold, his knapsack was gone. 
but he soon composed himself and thought, Thou hast been unfortunate from no fault of thine own, and straightway went back again to hell, complained of his misfortune to the old devil, and begged for his help. The devil said, Seat yourself, I will wash, comb and trim you, cut your hair and nails, and wash your eyes for you. And when he had done with him, he gave him the knapsack back again full of sweepings and said, Go, and tell the landlord that he must return you your money, or else I will come and fetch him, and he shall poke the fire in your place. Hans went up and said to the landlord, Thou hast stolen my money, if thou dost not return it, thou shalt go down to hell in my place, and wilt look as horrible as I. Then the landlord gave him the money, and more besides, only begging him to keep it secret. And Hans was now a rich man. He set out on his way home to his father, bought himself a shabby smock frock to wear, and strolled about making music, for he had learned to do that while he was with the devil in hell. There was, however, an old king in that country, before whom he had to play, and the king was so delighted with his playing that he promised him his eldest daughter in marriage. But when she heard that she was to be married to a common fellow in a smock frock, she said, Rather than do that, I would go into the deepest water. Then the king gave him the youngest, who was quite willing to do it to please her father. And thus, the devil's sooty brother got the king's daughter. And when the aged king died, the whole kingdom likewise. End of story 100 Story 101 of Household Tales Bearskin There was once a young fellow who enlisted as a soldier, conducted himself bravely, and was always the foremost when it rained bullets. So long as the war lasted, all went well, but when peace was made, he received his dismissal, and the captain said he might go where he liked. His parents were dead, and he had no longer a home. So he went to his brothers and begged them to take him in and keep him until war broke out again. The brothers, however, were hard-hearted and said, What can we do with thee? Thou art of no use to us. Go and make a living for thyself. The soldier had nothing left but his gun. He took that on his shoulder and went forth into the world. He came to a wide heath on which nothing was to be seen but a circle of trees. Under these he sat sorrowfully down and began to think over his fate. I have no money, thought he. I have learnt no trade but that of fighting, and now that they have made peace, they don't want me any longer. So I see beforehand that I shall have to starve. All at once he heard a rustling, and when he looked around, a strange man stood before him, who wore a green coat and looked right stately, but had a hideous cloven foot. I know already what thou art in need of, said the man. Gold and possession shall thou have, as much as thou canst make away with. Do what thou wilt. But first I must know if thou art fearless, that I may not bestow my money in vain. A soldier and fear? How can those two things go together? He answered. Thou canst put me to the proof. Very well then, answered the man. Look behind thee. The soldier turned round and saw a large bear, which came growling towards him. Oh, cried the soldier, I will tickle thy nose for thee so that thou shalt soon lose thy fancy for growling. And he aimed at the bear and shot it through the muzzle. It fell down and never stirred again. I see quite well, said the stranger, that thou art not wanting in courage, but there is still another condition which thou wilt have to fulfill. If it does not endanger my salvation, replied the soldier, who knew very well who was standing by him, if it does, I'll have nothing to do with it. Thou wilt look to that for thyself, answered the green coat. Thou shalt for the next seven years neither wash thyself, nor comb thy beard, nor thy hair, nor cut thy nails, nor say one paternoster. I will give thee a coat and a cloak, which during this time thou must wear. If thou diest during these seven years, thou art mine. If thou remainest alive, thou art free, and rich to boot or all the rest of thy life. The soldier thought of the great extremity in which he now found himself, and as he so soon often had gone to meet death, 
He resolved to risk it now also, and agreed to the terms. The devil took off his green coat, gave it to the soldier, and said, If thou hast this coat on thy back, and puttest thy hand into the pocket, thou wilt always find it full of money. Then he pulled the skin off the bear and said, This shall be thy cloak, and thy bed also, for thereon shalt thou sleep, and in no other bed shalt thou lie, and because of this apparel shalt thou be called bearskin. After this the devil vanished. The soldier put the coat on, felt at once in the pocket, and found that the thing was really true. Then he put on the bearskin and went forth into the world, and enjoyed himself, refraining from nothing that did him good and his money harm. During the first year his appearance was passable, but during the second he began to look like a monster. His hair covered nearly the whole of his face, his beard was like a piece of coarse felt, his fingers had claws, and his face was so covered with dirt that if cress had been sewn on it, it would have come up. Whosoever saw him ran away, but as he everywhere gave the poor money to pray that he might not die during the seven years, and as he paid well for everything, he still always found shelter. In the fourth year, he entered an inn where the landlord would not receive him, and would not even let him have a place in the stable, because he was afraid the horses would be scared. But as Bearskin thrust his hand into his pocket and pulled out a handful of ducats, the host let himself be persuaded and gave him a room in the outhouse. Bearskin was, however, obliged to promise not to let himself be seen, lest the inn should get a bad name. As Bearskin was sitting alone in the evening, and wishing from the bottom of his heart that the seven years were over, he heard a loud lamenting in a neighboring room. He had a compassionate heart, so he opened the door and saw an old man weeping bitterly and wringing his hands. Bearskin went nearer, but the man sprang to his feet and tried to escape from him. At last, when the man perceived that Bearskin's voice was human, he let himself be prevailed on, and by kind words, Bearskin succeeded so far that the old man revealed the cause of his grief. His property had dwindled away by degrees. He and his daughters would have to starve, and he was so poor that he could not pay the innkeeper, and was to be put in prison. If that is your only trouble, said Bearskin, I have plenty of money. He caused the innkeeper to be brought thither, paid him, and put a purse full of gold into the poor old man's pocket besides. When the old man saw himself set free from all his troubles, he did not know how to be grateful enough. Come with me, said he to Bearskin. My daughters all have miracles of beauty. Choose one of them for thyself as a wife. When she hears what thou hast done for me, she will not refuse thee. Thou dost in truth look a little strange, but she will soon put thee to rights again. This pleased Bearskin well, and he went. When the eldest saw him, she was so terribly alarmed at his face that she screamed and ran away. The second stood still and looked at him from head to foot, but then she said, How can I accept a husband who no longer has a human form? The shaven bear that once was here and passed itself off for a man pleased me far better for at any rate it wore a hussar's dress and white gloves. If it were nothing but ugliness, I might get used to that. The youngest, however, said, Dear father, that must be a good man to have helped you out of your trouble. So if you have promised him a bride for doing it, your promise must be kept. It was a pity that Bearskin's face was covered with dirt and with hair, for if not, they might have seen how delighted he was when he heard those words. He took a ring from his finger, broke it in two, and gave her one half. The other he kept for himself. He wrote his name, however, on her half and hers on his, and begged her to keep her peace carefully. And then he took his leave and said, I must still wander about for three years, and if I do not return then, thou art free, or I shall be dead but pray to God to preserve my life. The poor betrothed bride dressed herself entirely in black, 
and when she thought of her future bridegroom, tears came into her eyes. Nothing but contempt and mockery fell to her lot from her sisters. Take care, said the eldest, if thou givest him thy hand, he will strike his claws into it. Beware, said the second, bears like sweet things, and if he takes a fancy to thee, he will eat thee up. Thou must always do as he likes, begged the elder again, or else he will growl. And the second continued, but the wedding will be a merry one, for bears dance well. The bride was silent and did not let them vex her. Bearskin, however, traveled about the world from one place to another, did good where he was able, and gave generously to the poor that they might pray for him. At length, as the last day of the seven years dawned, he went once more out on to the heath, and seated himself beneath the circle of trees. It was not long before the wind whistled, and the devil stood before him and looked angrily at him. Then he threw Bearskin his old coat, and asked for his own green one back. We have not got so far as that yet, answered Bearskin. Thou must first make me clean. Whether the devil liked it or not, he was forced to fetch water, and wash Bearskin, comb his hair, and cut his nails. After this he looked like a brave soldier, and was much handsomer than he had ever been before. When the devil had gone away, Bearskin was quite light-hearted, he went into the town, put on a magnificent velvet coat, seated himself in a carriage drawn by four white horses, and drove to his bride's house. No one recognized him. The father took him for a distinguished general and led him into the room where his daughters were sitting. He was forced to place himself between the two eldest. They helped him to wine, gave him the best pieces of meat, and thought that in all the world they had never seen a handsomer man. The bride, however, sat opposite to him in her black dress and never raised her eyes, nor spoke a word. When at length he asked the father if he would give him one of his daughters to wife, the two eldest jumped up, ran to their bedrooms and put on splendid dresses, for each of them fancied she was the chosen one. The stranger, as soon as he was alone with his bride, brought out his half of the ring and threw it in a glass of wine, which he reached across the table to her. She took the wine, but when she had drunk it and found the half ring lying at the bottom, her heart began to beat. She got the other half which she wore on a ribbon round her neck, joined them, and saw that the two pieces fitted exactly together. Then said he, I am thy betrothed bridegroom, whom thou sawest as bearskin, but through God's grace I have again received my human form, and have once more become clean. He went up to her, embraced her, and gave her a kiss. In the meantime the two sisters came back in full dress, and when they saw that the handsome man had fallen to the share of the youngest, and heard that he was bearskin, they ran out full of anger and rage. One of them drowned herself in the well, the other hanged herself on a tree. In the evening, someone knocked at the door, and when the bridegroom opened it, it was the devil in his green coat, who said, Seest thou, I have now got two souls in the place of thy one. End of story 101